All right, Hotep, how's everybody doing? Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. I'm here in uh, New Jersey, still here in Newark. I'll be here for one more day. But uh, I was going doing research today, going through uh, current news stories. And, uh, you know, we posted about this uh, very disturbing story, allegations uh, made by uh, an African-American woman named Sharita Dixon Cole against a uh, state trooper uh, alleging uh, that he sexually assaulted her and raped her. This took place allegedly in North Texas, okay? And um, Sean King um Activist Sean King talked about this. He talked about this on the uh, Tom Jordan Morning Show. And that was actually how I actually found out about the uh, story. Well, actually, it was a, a social media post of Sean King. I saw it on his Facebook page. I follow him on Facebook. It went viral. He got about 80,000 likes. Uh, then he talked about it on the Tom Jordan Morning Show um, a couple of mornings ago on, what date was this? Uh, May 22nd, okay? Um, we talk, uh, he talked about it yesterday, May 22nd, uh, as well, okay? And uh, Tom Joyner has 8 million listeners, all right? Uh, well, what happened in the last, what happened uh, in the last few hours, or, um, yeah, uh, over the last few hours, um, body cam footage of the arrest was released, and the body cam footage... Uh, contradicts uh, the statements that she made and the allegations she made, okay? So we posted an article about this here on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this some um, here, right? And this is not an attack on anybody. This is not an attack on anybody, but this is an example, and I've studied a number of different cases. This is an example of why you have to use the word allegedly. This is why you have to say allegedly, uh, and you have to get all the facts in a case as well, okay? When accusing someone of a crime, you have to use allegedly until they have been proven guilty of a crime. This is across the board. This is not just for police officers. This is not just accusing African Americans. This is in general across the board, okay? All right, so, um, Everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. I'm in uh, Newark, New Jersey. I'll be on um, uh, Lord Jamar and uh, Raw Diggers' uh, podcast show tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I have to find out... Uh, uh, I have to find out how you all can tune in to it, okay? All right, so a lot of people saw, uh, heard about this story. Um, May 22nd, Tuesday, uh, May 22nd on the Time Jordan Morning Show, Sean King was on and he talked about this case. And he said, if you follow me on Facebook or Twitter, you may have seen a horrible story on my timeline over the past few days uh, on an early Sunday morning. Uh, on early Sunday morning, Sharita Dixon Cole was pulled over by police in Ellis County, Texas, outside of Dallas, Ellis County, Texas, outside of Dallas. He said first she was forced to perform a breathalyzer test. She complied and passed the test, but was told by the officer that she was that he was going to arrest her anyway because she had a bad attitude. OK, and then it goes all down here from there. And she made allegations that the police officer said that if she uh, performed sexual favors for her, uh, for him, she, he would let her go, um, and she, he made she also made allegations that he threatened to uh, shoot her boyfriend as well, her fiance, uh, who showed up on the scene uh, and said he was going to follow him to the police station. Um, um, she said that the officer told her uh, fiance that it was illegal for him to follow him follow the officer to the police station, etc. right? Uh, there's an article from blackamericaweb.com, Sean King, will Sharita Dixon Cole get justice? Sean King, will Sharita Dixon Cole get justice? Okay, once again, this is not an attack on anybody. This is analyzing what happened, okay? 
Um, so that was the second article, I think, from uh, BlackAmericaWeb.com. The first one was from um, uh, May 21st, okay, uh, which was, uh, I think, Monday, Monday, uh, May 21st, 2018. Um, report cop falsely arrest woman for DUI after sexually assaulting her, okay? And that's from BlackAmericaWeb.com as well, all right? So... The uh, story, uh, uh, news outlets are posting this story now. So when you check, uh, if, you, if you Google her name, Sharita Dixon Cole, you'll see these stories are coming out in the last half hour, last hour, last two hours, etc. All right, so two uh, articles I'm going to cite. One from a Fox uh, News affiliate, Fox 4, uh, fox4news.com out of Dallas. Uh, this was posted uh, May 23rd, 1055 a.m., um, and then, uh, and then you also have one from the griot.com. So within the last, uh, different outlets within the last six hours to one to two hours, the post in store, right? So, uh, if we look at the one from, uh, Fox 4 News, okay? Lawyer apologizes for falsely accusing trooper of rape. Lawyer apologizes for falsely accusing trooper of rape, okay? Now, once again, this is not an attack on anybody, all right? Um, from information that I've seen, from studies I've seen, the majority of the time when women, regardless of rape, majority of the time when women accuse someone of rape, the majority of the time they're telling the truth. Sometimes they do lie. This is not an attack on anybody. I think that women should be believed, but you need to do an investigation, but you definitely have to say, Allegedly, you definitely cannot just claim emphatically, declaratively that somebody did something, okay? Because you open yourself up to a lawsuit, all right? So, um, looking at the article from fox4news.com uh, from uh, May 23rd, the day is uh, May 23rd, 2018. An attorney is apologizing for spreading allegations that a Texas Department of Public Safety trooper sexually assaulted a woman during a traffic stop and arrest in North Texas, okay? So once again, this took place in um, Ellis, uh, was it Ellis County, okay? This took place in Ellis County, uh, Texas. Now, the apology came hours after the uh, Texas Department of Public Safety released two hours, two hours of the uh, state trooper's body cam video, two hours of the state trooper's body cam video. Around 1.30 a.m. Sunday morning, okay, to, so that had been May 20th, 2018, a state trooper pulled over 37-year-old Sharita Dixon Cole on suspicion of drunken driving. She told the trooper she was coming from downtown Dallas and heading to her fiance's house in uh, Waxahachie, uh, Waxahachie, Texas, I take it, I take it it is. She says she only had one drink, okay? During a field sobriety test, the state trooper pours out two bottles of alcohol he found in her back seat. He places her under arrest and asks her to sit in the front seat of his patrol vehicle. Now, it is true, just because you have open contents in the back seat doesn't mean you consume them, but I know here in the state of Michigan, it's illegal to have open bottles of alcohol in your vehicle. I don't know what it is in Texas, but I know in the state of Michigan, that's illegal. Now, that's the point when Sharita Dixon Cole, 37 years old, said that the state trooper offered to let her go and return for sexual favors. But that exchange is never heard in the body cam video, okay? Now, Sharita Dixon Cole also accused the officer of fondling, groping, and sexually assaulting her on the way to the jail. But those claims also are not supported by the video. Two hours of, um, uh, two hours of the state trooper's body cam video were released, okay? Now, hours after her arrest, well-known civil rights activist Sean King, who I like, I like Sean King. I think he does some really good work. 
I've posted articles about him. I follow him on Twitter. Follow me back, Sean. I follow him on Twitter. I follow him on Facebook. I like his commentary on the Times Joyner Morning Show. This is not an attack on Sean King either, okay? But hours after her arrest, well-known civil rights activist Sean King wrote on Facebook and Twitter, quote, this woman was kidnapped and raped by a Texas state trooper, end quote. Okay, hold on. Stop. 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 You open yourself up to a lawsuit when you do this. You can do what you want to do. I'm trying to tell you. He did not say allegedly, allegedly, and he put the officer's last name there in the social media post. Now, when you read this article from Fox4News.com, they actually show the social media post. OK, do you open yourself up to a lawsuit? You can't do that. He said this woman. Now, he has since removed those social media posts. It's up to the officer whether or not they sue. This is not, this is talking about in general and making allegations. You have to say allegedly. If you don't, the person can sue you, especially when it turns out that they're innocent. They can sue you. This woman was, this is what he said on the social media post. This woman was kidnapped and raped by a Texas state trooper. He gives the officer's last name. She is now being held hostage in Ellis County Jail. Okay, he never said allegedly. That's a huge problem. He, the social media post goes on to say Sharita Dixon Cole just happens to be a close personal friend of civil rights attorney slash my friend uh, Lee Merritt. Uh, and uh, these are the facts he got from her family. Now, what appears happened, what appears happened is that um uh, and uh, I'm still trying to get the facts, but w w I'm start, still trying to get everything. But what it appears happened at this point in time, Lee Merritt, who's a well-respected attorney, from what I understand, African-American attorney, I've seen him represent other cases and um, uh, cases of police brutality, things like this, right? It appears that Lee Merritt, thinking that Sharita Dixon Cole was telling the truth, it appears Lee Merritt contacted Sean King. And Sean King thinking that uh, the woman is telling Lee Merritt the truth, then goes out and tries to do the right thing. This this is what appears happened, okay? And I personally, I feel sorry for Sean King because he put his reputation out here on the line and he got burned, okay? If he had said allegedly, if he had said this is an accusation, okay? He wouldn't be in deep trouble. All right. Uh, now, I don't know if the officer is going to sue or anything like that. But what I'm saying is, is that when you go out here and you make accusations like this and you don't say allegedly and it turns out that this person was lying or apparently lying, being untruthful, whoever, whatever it is, it, it hurts your credibility. It blows up in your face. So I really feel sorry for Sean King because Sean King was on the Tom Jordan Morning Show talking about this. Tom Joyner has 8 million listeners. This ain't an AM station with, with, with 500 listeners. No, Tom Joyner has 8 million listeners. Okay? All right, so this is why when, when I'm doing research on different cases, man, this is why sometimes, you know, I'm not so quick to take in a, a popular opinion. I want to get more facts in these cases because I've, case, I've seen cases in the past where it turns out the person was lying. Okay? Now, um... So, Sean, so hours after the arrest, well-known civil rights activist Sean King wrote on Facebook and Twitter, this woman was kidnapped and raped by a Texas state trooper, right? Sean King included a detailed explanation of the claims as explained by Sharita Dixon Cole and her attorney Lee Merritt. Now, listening to the claim, first of all, I read it on Facebook and I was blown away by it. I said, man, this is crazy. You know, uh, you, know you want to believe the woman, but... You know, me being a researcher, I want to get more facts. I said, this thing is crazy. If this is true, it's horrific what happened. Now, Sean King's post accusing the state trooper of sexual assault was shared on social media nearly 80,000 times. They have since been deleted. Department of Public Safety, Texas Department of Public Safety, responded to the accusations late Tuesday night by releasing the video in full. The only parts that were blurred or rendered inaudible were those where personal identification information is shared. Okay. And they'll 
uh, oftentimes do that so the person's not given, you, you don't hear in the tape them giving their address and different things like this. That information is considered confidential by a state statute, uh, the Texas Department of Public Safety stated. Uh, now, the, par the department also said, quote, the department is appalled that anyone would make such a despicable, slanderous, and false accusation against a peace officer who willingly risks his life every day to protect and serve the public, okay? All right, now, it's important to understand that people in all walks of life lie. Police officers sometimes lie. People sometimes of all different races lie. Men sometimes lie, women sometimes lie, okay? So, um, it's in this particular case, it appears it was the woman who lied. But in other cases, we know it's the police officers who lie, okay? For instance, we all have seen the video of this African-American man um, who was just released from prison in the last couple of weeks. He did about 17 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. Uh, Reverend Al Sharpton interviewed him on Politics Nation, okay? He did 17 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. The police officer who arrested him lied, okay? And this guy did 17 years in prison, wrongfully convicted. We've seen numerous cases where the police lie. We've seen other cases where people lie on the police. So this is not an attack on anybody. This is just dealing with the facts, okay? All right, now, um, Attorney Lee Merritt apologized on Facebook for accusing this police officer. So it appears, right now, it appears that Attorney Lee Merritt was lied to by his client. It appears that Sean King was basically lied to by the client as well. Because Sean King, in, um, in his broadcast on Time Jordan Morning Show, he said he talked to Sharita and he talked to Sharita's fiance. So if he talked to Sharita's fiance and, and, and her fiance is saying that he had an interaction with the officer and he wanted to follow the officer, the officer told him it's illegal to follow. And these, if, that, if, if, if that is true, then it's, it, either, either it appears two people lied or just one person lied. I'm still trying to find out. This is crazy. Because <laughs> when, when you go through and read it, then you have to ask the question, okay, did the fiancé lie also or was the fiancé telling the truth and it was just the woman who lied? We'll come to some of your comments here in just a minute. But this is crazy. But this is why in cases like this, you have to, you know, you have to say allegedly. Because this is, this is crazy. All right, so attorney Lee Merritt wrote on Facebook an apology. He said it is deeply troubling when innocent parties are falsely accused. And I am truly sorry for any trouble these claims may have caused. Okay. Attorney Lee Merritt said he does not believe the video from the Texas Department of Safety was edited or tampered with in any way because they released um, what, two hours of uh, what, what, they released two uh, they released two hours of the state troopers body cam footage. All right. Now, uh, Attorney Lee Merritt also said he does not believe the video from the DPS was edited or tampered in any way. He watched it in full. And does believe the state trooper acted professionally during the stop and the arrest. And Attorney Lee Merritt also issued uh, uh, an apology. It was like uh, an apology on his Facebook page. And it says, uh, so he's Lee Merritt on Facebook, M-E-R-R-I-T-T, -T, if you want to follow him. And we'll go ahead and follow him. Um, and this is uh, from the Merritt Law Firm. Uh, he says, press release concerning released body cam footage by Texas DPS statement. The body camera footage released directly conflicts with the accounts reported to my office. The body camera footage released directly conflicts with the accounts reported to my office. There is no readily apparent evidence of tampering with the footage. Officer, so I'm going to say the officer's name because this, his name is in the um, apology from Attorney Lee Merritt, okay? Officer Daniel Hubbard seems to comport himself professionally 
during the duration of the traffic stop and arrest uh, without without more uh, and arrest without more should be cleared of any wrongdoing. It is deeply troubling when innocent parties are falsely accused, and that, and I am truly sorry for any trouble uh, these claims may have caused. Officer Hubbard and his family, I take full responsibility for amplifying these claims to the point of national concern. The office regularly receives hundreds, he said this office, referring to his law office, this office regularly regularly receives hundreds of complaints of abuse from across the nation. And we are obligated to filter these message, messages thoroughly before relaying them to our power, powerful allies, such as a Sean King, okay, Black Lives Matter civil rights activist. Our office necessarily takes claims of abuse, particularly by law enforcement officers, very seriously. It is our responsibility to call for swift, transparent, and thorough investigation into any such accusation. Our calls for professionalism and adherence to protocol, however, should not be misconstrued as a rush to judgment. Our calls for professionalism and adherence to protocol, however, should not be misconstrued as a, as a rush to judgment. To the contrary, our goal is presenting uh, claims of misconduct is to arrive as quickly and as accurately as possible to the truth. We are thankful to the members of the community willing to echo our demands for transparency and justice. However, in this matter, it seems your righteous vig vigilance was abused, okay? So, um, and the reason why something like this is so important, so what we're going to do, uh, this is on um, his Facebook uh, page, so we're going to post the uh, link to uh, the official statement from Attorney Lee Merritt. We'll post it here on the thread of the broadcast, okay? Um, so, when something like this happens, right, you have a lot of well-meaning people around the country, African-Americans especially, who want to get involved, who want to do something, who want to protest. And what something like this does, and this is not an attack on her, I'm just speaking in general, but what something like this does is it causes people to be reluctant about getting involved, coming to the aid of somebody. Who has been who has been done wrong, especially by police. Okay, so this is why one we have to use the term allegedly, and this is why, like when I'm on the radio, even Facebook Live broadcast, I'll use the term allegedly because I understand this. I've been doing research for years. Okay, um, two, a Peter a Peter Bailey, who was a friend of Malcolm X and wrote for Malcolm X's newspaper for the. Organization of Afro American Unity. A. Peter Bailey is a journalist. He was speaking at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History on um, Malcolm X Day this past uh, last Saturday. This past Saturday, I broadcasted it here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. You can go back and watch it. A. Peter Bailey talked about uh, a time. Uh, he talked about uh, a, um, a, a one of his memories of, of Malcolm. And he was writing for the newspaper and was dealing with a police killing. And uh, they wrote, uh, A. Peter Bailey wrote that the officer murdered such and such a person. And he said, Malcolm told him, no, he said, you can't call it a murder. He said, murder is a legal term. He said, murder is a legal term. He said, you have to call it a killing until the officer is convicted or if the officer is convicted you cannot call it a murder he said because if you call it a murder okay and that officer is acquitted that officer can then sue you because you called it a murder murder is a legal term he said you have to he said malcolm told him you have to call it a killing okay this is an example of that and if you watch MSNBC, I remember watching uh, Melissa Harris Perry when she was on MSNBC on Saturday and Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Joanne Reed has her spot now, AM Joy. There was a case of uh, uh, a police officer killing, a police officer uh, killing someone. And one of the guests she interviewed, I can't I think it may have been an activist or something like this, but they said the police murdered 
this person. And she said uh, something to the effect of, I understand your passion, but murder is a legal term. And she said, we have to call it a killing right now because the officer had not been convicted. You can be sued. All right. Let me give you another example. Uh, I'm on 19 a.m. the Superstation, WFDF in Detroit. And um, the radio station uh, just picked up the uh, Reverend Al Sharpton show, Politics Nation, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday through Friday. But um, Reverend Al Sharpton was a uh, caller called in, and they were talking about uh, some, they were talking about, the caller was talking about Dr. King and talking about how Dr. King was passive and Dr. King should have talked about arming people and stuff like this. Some idiotic nonsense. Because if you actually research Dr. King, now this caller has not researched Dr. King. If you actually research Dr. King, Dr. King owned guns. And, and during the Montgomery bus boycott, Dr. King tried to get a concealed pistol license in Montgomery, Alabama, but he was denied a concealed pistol license. Now, if you did not own a gun, why would you get a concealed pistol license? Dr. King owned guns. He just did not say, bring your guns to the, to, to the march. Dr. King was not stupid. People need to research Dr. King. Read a book by Charles E. Cobb Jr. called This Nonviolent Stuff That Get You Killed, How Guns Made the Civil Rights Movement Possible. This Nonviolent Stuff That Get You Killed, How Guns Made the Civil Rights Movement Possible by Charles E. Cobb Jr. Okay, not only is he a history professor, but he was a field secretary for SNCC, Student Violent Non-Coordinated Committee. He was a field secretary for SNCC for uh, five years in rural Mississippi. Okay? Now, if you know anything about rural Mississippi back during those times, back during the 60s, you know that's very dangerous work. You out here trying to register African Americans to vote and, and, and organize them for the right to vote uh, in rural Mississippi. Okay? And he said when the civil rights workers got there, Charles E. Cobb Jr. said when the civil rights workers got there down there in Mississippi, he said that the African Americans who lived in Mississippi, they grew up in a gun culture. So all of them owned guns. They had shotguns. They had rifles. You know, you live on a farm. You may have to shoot at, um, at animals trying to come and kill your livestock or animals trying to come and eat your vegetation, things like this. You know, you, you, you're away from the main city. You have a sheriff that patrols. You, you got to be able to protect yourself. He said, so he said they never stayed in someone's home who didn't have a gun there. It's a gun over the fireplace or a gun up on the mantle or something like that. Gun on the nightstand. They grew, the, the, African Americans in the South and white people in the South grew up in a gun culture. And he said that when they first got down, when the civil rights workers first got down there in Mississippi, he said, the black people down there said, we know you're nonviolent, but we're not. And we're not going to let these white people kill you. So there were African Americans who had guns who protected the civil rights workers down there as they went and did their work. OK, this now later, that's going to be the Deacons for Defense and Justice. But they were not founded until July 10th, 1964 in Jonesboro, Louisiana, the Deacons for Defense and Justice. And they protected civil rights workers during the marches. And they also did personal protection for Dr. King sometimes. And sometimes Dr. King would hire them to protect work, to protect civil rights workers during marches. Because the, the local police and the state troopers largely were not protecting the civil rights workers from the white supremacists and the bigots that were trying to attack them and kill them. Okay? So we organized ourselves to protect ourselves. Core Congress of Racial Equality they were the ones that used the Deacons for the Defense and Justice probably the most. They used it even more so than Dr. King and the SCLC or the NAACP, okay? But before they were formally organized, you had African Americans who just organized themselves and didn't even have a name, okay? And then also uh, in the early 1960s, uh, right around 1960 or so, late 50s, right around 1960, you had Robert F. Williams and the Black Guard. And he wrote the book, A Negroes with Guns, Robert F. Williams. Now, Robert F. Williams, he was the president of the, of the Monroe County, uh, North Carolina chapter of the NAACP. The Monroe County, North Carolina chapter of the NAACP. This was Robert F. Williams. And he organized African Americans into the, to the Black Guard, which was like a, gun, a black gun club. 
And they weren't they weren't talking about let's go out and kill people. They, no, they weren't doing that. They were talking about defending themselves and defending the civil rights workers. Okay? So we have a we have a we have a history of this. All right. Unfortunately, when you have some of the mainstream civil rights leaders that talk about the civil rights movement, Negroes with guns is not talked about. I, I still can't figure out why they don't talk about Negroes with guns. That's part of the history. That, that's part of the history. OK. All right. So. How's everybody doing? OK. Hey, if you like this type of information, also be sure to uh, register for the online courses that I teach. Uh, we have them all on demand. They're in a bundle pack on sale right now, only sixty dollars, regularly one hundred, regularly one hundred thirty dollars. Uh, it's a ten course bundle pack. It includes ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. That's a uh, 14 hour, seven session online course. We do a thousand years of history, African American history as well, African history. Talk about the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. Uh, so check that out. That bundle pack also includes great African women in history, the mothers of civilization, and it includes. Um, African American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and high elections have consequences. Uh, so the number and and it includes uh, online uh, class I did dealing with the film Black Panther also. So that's all in the bundle pack. It's on sale right now, sixty dollars, regularly one hundred thirty dollars. Um, it's a uh, ten course bundle pack, um, and we posted the link here. If you need me to post it again, let me know. It's also at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Also, uh, we'll come to some of your comments here in just a minute, and I'm going to go to this other article here. Uh, if you like this type of information, uh, you can also support the African History Network. Donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We posted the link here, paypal.me me forward slash the AHN show, and that helps support us. That helps us to keep doing the research, stay on the air, broadcast, pay the bills, etc. Okay? All right, let's go to some of your comments here. Um, Okay, Jim said, can't have the First Amendment without fully embracing the Second Amendment. Uh, that's not true. The First Amendment and the Second Amendment are not related. If you actually read them and understand them, <laughs> they're not related. Uh, people have a gross misinterpretation of the Second Amendment as if it gives unfettered access to guns, and that's not true. Even a federal judge ruled that um, U.S. citizens don't have unfettered access to guns. That's a total, that's a total misunderstanding of the Second Amendment. Um... Sandy, uh, let's see, let's go back. Uh, Tasha, yeah, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll post the website link here. Okay. Um, Willie said, I for one wouldn't falsely accuse anyone of a crime. I honestly know uh, they, I honestly know they didn't comment or uh, comment in Sharita's potential case. I am mystified because the video I attempted to watch was dark with uh, mostly uh talk i didn't see or hear anything contrary to her claims not shedding any uh did you read the article that i posted they released two hours of body cam footage read the article read the comments from her attorney lee merritt they re they released two hours of body cam footage okay so and read the comments from her attorney all right which article did you read Jim said the Second Amendment was so important that it was put second. If the Second Amendment was so important, Jim, why wasn't it included in the in the original U.S. Constitution? The Second Amendment is part of the Bill of Rights. That did not come along to 1791. The U.S. Constitution was signed September 17, 1787. So, if the Second Amendment was so important, why was not why was it not included in the original Constitution? It was not part of the original Constitution. That's why it's called an amendment. An amendment is to change something, to add something to it. That does not come along to 1791. Please do some research on the Second Amendment. Also read Federal, Federalist Paper number 29 as well by Alexander Hamilton. Because the Federalist Paper number 29 uh, gives background information on what the Second Amendment was about. Okay, But the reason why you have a lot of white men who talk about the Second Amendment is because you have a lot of scared white men who are hoarding guns because they fear African American men. 
So about 326 million people in the U.S., 78% of the U.S. population don't own guns. 50% of the guns in the country are owned for 3% of the population. Over the, the, over the overwhelming majority are white men. Okay, and if you read the article from Scientific American uh, that talked about uh, white men hoarding guns, um, and uh, they dealt with uh, the Second Amendment and things like this, um, this breaks down history, okay? This breaks down that information. Why are white men stockpiling guns? Why are white men stockpiling guns? Research suggests it's largely because they're anxious about their ability to protect their families, insecure about their place in the job market, and be set by racial fears. But the study actually shows that uh, the majority of white people are killed, are killed by other white people, not the African Americans. So why is this such a fear of black men? Why is this such a fear of African Americans? It's, perpe it's perpetuated by the media and people who don't understand history, who are ignorant, and a lot of them can't read, they buy into these fears. And then you have the gun manufacturers who use their gun, who use the gun lobby, and the gun lobby, especially the NRA, largely to protect the gun manufacturers and advocate on behalf of the gun manufacturers. They don't advocate on behalf of the citizens. That's a front. They advocate on behalf of the gun manufacturers. Okay, um, they keep buying into the nonsense. All right. So we just posted a link here to this article from Scientific American. Why are white men stockpiling guns? Why are white men stockpiling guns? People should people should read that and do some do some accurate historical research, some scientific research before they come on here uh, showing how much they don't know. It's better to remain silent than have people think that you are a fool. Then they'll open up your mouth and remove all doubt. Okay. Then you should read an article from MarketWatch.com. Okay. And MarketWatch.com, uh, this article is entitled. What America's gun fanatics won't tell you. What America's gun fanatics won't tell you. This is from June 18, 2016. See, unlike a lot of people, I actually do research. I read the studies. I read the books. I read the articles. I actually do research. I'm a researcher. Okay? The Second Amendment doesn't give you the right to own a gun. The Second Amendment does not give you the right to own a gun. This is what a lot of people don't know. Okay? And... It also cites the Federalist Papers, which a lot of people don't even know what the Federalist Papers are, okay? But it cites Federalist Paper number 29, written by Alexander Hamilton. Now, if you know anything about the, if you know anything about the U.S. Constitution during the spring of 1787, what was called the Philadelphia Convention, you have the drafting of the Constitution and you have them arguing the merits in different parts of the Constitution, right? So you're going to have the Federalist Papers that are written. And these were groups of about 80 or so letters arguing different parts of the Constitution, arguing for it to be ratified. Because once it once it's voted on at the Philadelphia Convention, then it has to be ratified by three quarters of the state legislatures, okay? The, the states in the Union has to be ratified by three quarters of the state legislatures and it has to pass the state legislatures by a two-third majority vote okay this is the ratification process okay so um the federalist papers were uh, a group of letters and essays things like this that a lot of the framers of the constitution and the delegates wrote and they were sent to newspapers and published in newspapers around the country uh, to argue for different aspects of the Constitution and, and argue for it to be uh, uh, ratified, okay? So, uh, in the article here from Market Watch, most people have never read this article, what did the Founding Fathers mean by that? Okay, so it says the, the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution does not just say Congress shall not infringe the right to, quote, quote keep their arms. It specifically says that right exists in order to maintain, quote unquote, a well regulated militia, a well regulated militia, not just any militia, not some good old boys who, who dip snuff with shotguns, but a well regulated militia. Now, the question you would ask yourself is regulated by who? If, if, if it says that 
Congress shall not infringe the right to, to keep and bear arms, and that this is in place to maintain a well-regulated militia, then the question you should ask yourself is who is the militia regulated by? Now, even the late, even the late conservative Supreme Court associate John Antonin Scalia admitted those words were not in there by accident. And the Constitution does not just say militia, it says a, it says a well-regulated militia. Okay, so what did the Founding Fathers mean by a well-regulated militia? Okay. We don't have to guess because they told us. In Federalist Paper number 29 of the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton explained at great length precisely what a well-regulated well militia was, why the Founding Fathers thought we needed one, and why they wanted to protect it from being disarmed by the federal government. So you have to go to the Federalist Papers. Federalist Papers number 29 is a link to it here in article. And there's a reason absolutely no gun extremist will ever direct you to that 1788 essay because it blows their baloney into a million pieces. They don't, they don't direct you. These, these people who argue the Second Amendment and a lot of these white men that argue the Second Amendment, they won't direct you to the Federalist Papers. They won't direct you to Federalist Papers number 29. Number one, most of them haven't read it, haven't read the Federalist Papers. Two, most of them don't know what the Federalist Papers are. They don't do this. They just be talking to the news over John Kennedy or Russian ball or something like this, right? A quote unquote well regulated militia did not mean guys who read Soldier of Fortune magazine running around in the woods with AK 47s and war paint on their faces. It basically meant what today we call the National Guard. It should be a properly constituted ordered and drilled, quote-unquote, well-regulated well uh, military force, organized state by state, explained by Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton is one of the framers of the Constitution. He's explaining to you, okay, what well-regulated militia means. He's explaining to you the Second Amendment. The militia needed, quote, uniformity and organization and discipline, wrote Alexander Hamilton, so that it could operate like a proper army, quote, in camp and in and field, quote, and so that it could gain the essential degree of proficiency in military functions, okay? And although it was organized state by state, it needed to be under the explicit control of the national government. And although it was organized state by state, it needed to be under the explicit control of the national government. <coughs> the well-regulated militia was under the command of the president. It was, quote, the military arm, end quote, of the government. So check out this article here. This is from MarketWatch.com. What America's gun fanatics won't tell you. This is from June 18, 2016 by uh, Brett Arends, A-R-E-N-D-S. Read, read the Federalist Papers. Specifically, Federalist Paper number 29, okay? And it uh, gives all this background information. So all the, all the gun nuts, they won't tell you this. I wonder why. They won't, they won't break down this information at all. I wonder why. I wonder why they don't share these facts with you. All right, Delana, how you doing? Okay. Let's go to some of your comments here. Cory Booker uh, said, Truth, Eldridge, I'm here in Nevis, the birthplace of Alexander Hamilton. Adila, uh, good morning. How you doing? Uh, okay, you must be out on the West Coast with this morning time. Eldridge, what is that pick above your left shoulder? Uh, I don't even know, man. I don't even know. I'm out of town. This is not my place. I don't even know. It's a uh, some type of design, some type of design. It's a painting. I don't even know. All right. Dan Rex said it's fear of the behavior of their ancestors. Uh, Willie said especially after the publicity apologized 
especially after he publicly apologized to the officer. Delaney said, but it's also tied into masculinity. I think she's talking about ownership of guns. Okay. No, it's tied directly to a fear of African American men. You have to understand history. It's definitely tied into a fear of African American men. Okay. And this fear is perpetuated by the media, by news outlets, etc. Okay. All right. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotel. I'm out of town. I'm here in Newark, New Jersey. I'll be uh, on the uh, Lord Jamar of the Brand Nubians. The Brand Nubians. I'll be uh, on. Uh, I'll be with Lord Jamar and Rod Digger, uh, two hip hop artists. Uh, I'll be on their podcast tonight at 7 p.m. Um, I'm not sure if they broadcast it live or not, but I'll be on with the uh, Herb Alchemist. You've seen it here on Facebook, so we'll talk about uh, an event coming up in San Diego uh, in August. Uh, Return of the Gods, uh, the real family reunion. Okay, we're breaking up some. It should clear up here. It should clear up here. Okay, I want to go to some more of your comments. Uh, El just said, wow, there's a picture like that here in my law office. Okay, so if you like this type of information, uh, be sure to register for the online courses that, that I teach. Uh, we have them all on demand. We have a bundle pack. Uh, it's 10 in the bundle pack. It's regularly $130 on sale right now, $60. It includes ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. This is a, uh, it's all on demand. It's a 14-hour, seven-session online course. You deal with thousands of years of history, thousands of years of African history, deal with the transatlantic slave trade, uh, ancient Egypt, the 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors that uh, bring Europe out of the Dark Ages and set uh, Columbus up to sail on his four voyages. Uh, so we do a lot of information. You also uh, get African-American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and how elections have consequences. Also in that bundle pack is an um, um, online class I did dealing with the film Black Panther. Uh, great African women in history, the mothers of civilizations, a lot in that bundle pack. So register for that. You can watch from around the world. It's all on demand. Go at your own, go at your own pace. Okay. Uh, Johnson said it's a false sense of security because of their cowardice. Get rid of the guns and watch the cowards run. Okay. Um, let's see here. Let's look at some of your comments. Corey said, Brother Michael, I wonder why she would lie. It's a good question. Uh, I think she was trying to avoid an arrest. It, it appears possibly the motivation was trying to avoid an arrest. We'll probably find out more. Uh, but I feel sorry for uh, I feel sorry for uh, Sean King because he got involved and got his reputation involved in this and also Attorney Lee Merritt as well. Okay, They got their uh, Reputations involved in this. All right. Black re retribution is a known fear of, of uh, some white people in the country. All right. Okay. And those in the Detroit area, you know, African Liberation Day is coming up. Uh, was it's celebrated around the world? African Liberation Day, May twenty fifth. But um, African Liberation Day is taking place at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Uh, Friday, May 25th, Saturday, May 26th. So I'll be there. And um, uh, Dr. Way, Dr. Ray Winbush, who you heard on my radio show on Sunday night, Dr. Ray Winbush will be the uh, keynote speaker on Friday. He's doing a workshop on Saturday at 2.30 p.m. dealing with reparations. I do my workshop on Saturday at 3.30 p.m. dealing with the film Black Panther. Lessons from the film Black Panther, Economic Guerrilla Warfare, Political Self-Defense, and How to Wakanda the Vote. Economic Guerrilla, Lessons from the film Black Panther, Economic Guerrilla Warfare, Political Self-Defense, and How to Wakanda the Vote. So my workshop is Saturday, 3.30 p.m. I'll be on the lower level of the uh, Charles Wright Museum of African American History. Both days, free event. Uh, come on out and uh, I have my DVDs, some of my workshop, some of those from me. Uh, we have my lectures 
dealing with the film Black Panther also at our website AfricanHistoryNetwork.com AfricanHistoryNetwork.com so check that out and here is um, we'll post the information here on the thread of the broadcast also this is from the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History um, and the program starts at 12 noon on Saturday 12 noon to about 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. on Saturday okay Uh, here we go. Let me post this here on the thread. All right, this is dealing with African Liberation Day. Is that the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History? All right, so for some information on African Liberation Day. So May 25th is African Liberation Day, and on on this day, many African countries celebrate the hard-fought achievement of their freedom from European colonial powers. And we know that Ghana was the first one to win their independence in 1957. But we know that Haiti won their independence, um, African Caribbean nation, Haiti won their independence in 1804. Declared their independence January 1st, 1804 from the French. All right. So some background information on African Liberation Day. Now I asked, I asked people the question, if you wear green on St. Patrick's Day, Will you wear red, black, and green on African Liberation Day? If not, why not? If you wear green on St. Patrick's Day, will you wear red, black, and green on African Liberation Day? Okay. So, um, although widely observed on a global scale by various African communities, African Liberation Day is not a federal holiday in many countries, including Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States. May 25th is a public holiday in Ghana. So African Freedom Day, African Freedom Day was founded during the first conference of independent African states, which attracted African leaders and political activists from various African countries. In Ghana on April 15, 1958, government representatives from eight independent African states attended the conference. Okay, this was the conference of independent African states. And... Um, this was the first Pan-African Conference on the continent of Africa, the first Pan-African con uh, Conference on the continent of Africa. The purpose of the day was to annually mark the liberation movement's progress, to annu annually mark the liberation movement's progress, and to symbolize the, the determination of the people of Africa to free themselves from foreign domination and exploitation. So 1958 is the year after um, Ghana wins its independence from the uh, uh, gain their independence from the British. Okay, that's 1957. So between 1958 and 1963, the nation class struggle grew bigger in Africa and around the world. During this period of time, 17 uh, countries in Africa won their independence, and 1960 was proclaimed the Year of Africa. 1960 was proclaimed the Year of Africa. On May 25th, 1963, 31 African leaders convened a summit meeting to found the Organization of African Unity, the Organization of African Unity, also known as the OAU. So the OAU was founded on May 25th, 1963. Okay, you had 31 African leaders um, representing these African nations, th representing 31 African nations, and they convened a summit a summit meeting to found the Organization of African Unity on May 25th, 1963. They renamed African Freedom Day as African Liberation Day and changed its date to May 25th instead of April 15th. The, uh, May 25th was, was the founding date of the Organization of African Unity, okay? And they also called it Africa Day. All right, now Malcolm X, in 1964, he founds the Organization of Afro-American Unity for African Americans here in this country, and that name was based upon the Organization of African Unity. African Liberation Day has helped to raise political awareness in African communities across the world. It has also been a source of information about the struggles for liberation and development, okay? 
All right. Many symbols, many or so when we look at symbols of African Liberation Day, many organizations use an outline of the map of Africa or the shape of Africa as a feature to symbolize the day. Uh, Pan-African colors, which are widely used for the day, come in different sets of three colors, the green, gold, and red colors used in the flag of Ghana, green, gold, and red. And the red, black, and green colors adopted by the American-based Universal Negro Improvement Association and uh, founded by uh, Marcus uh, Mosiah Garvey and African, Communi and African Communities League, Universal Negro Improvement Association and African uh, Communities League, that's the UNIA, okay? So that's some background information on African Liberation Day. Uh, so search for African Liberation Day celebrations in your uh, community. And uh, it's going down in Detroit, May 25th and uh, Saturday, May 26th at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. All right. Okay. Willie said, knowing your level of research, I wasn't doubting you or your information at all. All right. Uh, actually read the articles. Okay. All right, Corey. Okay. All right. So look, we got to get out of here.